Thanks for joining us inside the Dancers Studio, where we bring listeners like you closer to the creative process. Inside the Dancers Studio is a program of the National Center for Choreography at the University of Akron as part of our Ideas in Motion initiative. This episode was recorded in the presence of a virtual audience in 2023. Today, we join Christy Bolingbroke, our Executive Artistic Director, in conversation with three New York City-based choreographers who are on the ground in Akron, sharing a creative residency in the spring of 2023. First, we hear from Tendai Kumba, then Annie B. Parsons, and finally, Donna Okazono. Tendai Kumba, one of Dance Magazine's 25 to watch in 2023, international dancer, choreographer, singer, and songwriter. Tendai is a graduate of North Atlanta High School of Performing Arts and Spelman College. Awarded Cheetah Rivera's Outstanding Female for her role as Lady in Brown in the Tony-nominated Broadway revival for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Tendai is a former touring company member of Urban Bushwomen and background vocalist, dancer, and original cast member of the special Tony Award-winning David Byrne's American Utopia on Broadway, World Tour, and the HBO film adaptation directed by Spike Lee. Tendai also is a longtime collaborator with partner Greg Purnell under the alias You Fly Mothership with Sonic Choreographic Projects like Heroin, Incognito, UFO, Unidentified Fly Objects, among many others. Please join me in welcoming Tendai Kumba. So I am curious, with all of your performance accolades, when did you decide to become a choreographer? Was there a moment or a certain event that sort of set that into motion? Um, I think it's been a working uh building thing in me for a while. Um, even from college, I was very interested in creating work. But I've also been really blessed to work with a lot of amazing choreographers that are rooted in collaboration mm-hmm. and really um, make space for creation. And so I feel like I was tapping into my choreographer bone long before I claimed it um, in various spaces. So it's nice that now I, I feel like now I've earned the right to step in a place of like, yes, I'm a choreographer. Yes. Mm -hmm. You were just practicing. You were rehearsing. We understand that before. (laughs) Just kind of sharpening the tools. Massaging it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do you like to look for your inspiration? All right. Every choreographer works differently. When when you're starting on your own work, where does that begin? Oh, it I mean, it begins in so many spaces. I mean, one, living in New York is inspirational in itself. Um traveling on the train, little things can just spark so many thoughts. Also as a vocalist and um, my partner, Greg Purnell, who we create work together, that inspiration also kind of comes with other humming sounds come to mind. I just Mm. try to let that um, lead, lead the way, which is kind of what's happening with this work. It started off from a hum and a tune and then it just I was like, let me just keep on revisiting this and see where it opens up to and then how it feels earned in the body. Mm. So, yeah, a little bit of everything. And also, I think a lot about teachers that I've had that have left an imprint on me Mm -hmm. um, and tools that they've used in creation. Um, And I feel like I tap into those things as well. Mm. So uh, I love this idea you know, that it, it it comes also from your, you know, ability as a vocalist. And and I've heard others also remind me that dancers and singers have the same instrument, right? Mm-hmm. That is the body. Mm-hmm. So what do you look for then in dancers? Do they also need to be able to tap that vocalist ability and instrument? Or are there other things you know, especially for some of maybe our um, emerging dancers, some of our dance students out there who are also like, what if I want to dance like Tendai one day? <laughs> what is what is it to dance like Tendai? I don't know. Um, but I mean, I look for dancers that are bold and brave and daring. Um, I've, I look for dancers that you don't have to be a vocalist, but there's a 
you're rooted in the strength of your voice mm. and being able to find whatever to push those notes out, not worrying about it necessarily being pretty, but pushing out first to find that breath, find your voice in the space and really feel how it moves through your body rather than kind of forcing it. Um, so that's one thing I look for. I look for musicality. I, I listen to a lot of or create a lot of polyrhythmic um, overlapping between music play and body play. And mm. so um, I definitely listen to a lot of the nuances between notes, between breaths. Um, yeah, those are the things that I'm drawn to a lot and also speaks a lot to the people that I've been able to create with here and then just in my career that I gravitate and have gravitated towards. So it's interesting. Listening uh, and be able to do nuanced listening mm -hmm. sounds like definitely something that you look for. Yeah. But just because you're a vocalist doesn't mean that they have to literally be able to sing. No. I love that idea of voice and bold in your voice as a metaphor. Um, to, yeah. to and and really personality too. Yeah, and personality. I mean, I'm also like musical theater background as well. So I a lot of, you know, expression, communication, and like the melding of the pedestrian in us and how that comes into the studio rather than cutting off that part of ourselves to dance. I want mm. to bring that in with us because that's why we're dancing. That's why we decided to keep dancing as people. Um, mm. And us as movers have this deep strength in our bodies and this muscle and so I feel it's really beautiful when dancers vocalize, even when they're not considering themselves a singer, but when they vocalize, because we pull from like a deep breath, a deep guttural breath to put those notes out. And you can, I well, I can feel that when I've seen other people's work as well. Um, when you are like breathing so heavy and as movers, we're used to just going, 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 going. We have this amazing sense of dur like duration. Mm -hmm. Um and so to how to meld and use that duration to kind of keep on grinding that muscle and then let the air and the noise, the noise come out um, is something that I'm drawn to and that I really love to build around in my own work. Mm. The uh, I want to invite you to describe your movement aesthetic, right? Like still to this day, hmm. come to my dance show can be a very scary proposition <laughs> to, <laughs> to the uninitiated. Yeah. Um, and, and at the same time, the field is, is expanding so much more than, than it was even 50, 60 years ago um, in terms of the types of dance that we're seeing on stage. How do, would you describe your movement style or aesthetic? Hmm. Um, I would describe my movement, a lot of a melding pot. Um, mm. I was one of those students that was in a point ballet class and then went to West African class and then went to yes. tap class and it all, but they all made sense together for me. So mm. I'm, my movement, I feel like I try to tap into every layer of, uh, African diasporic forms, but through a contemporary lens and a spiritual um, spiritual kind of, I don't know, container mm -hmm. in a way. Um, You're my, a vessel. Yeah, I try it. That's absolutely, that's, that's what I feel like. And that's when I teach or even when choreographing, uh, it feeling earned in the body. So there's mm -hmm. every much as though if there's an undulation, there's also the tondu is not just a tondu, like how to breathe through that. Um, yeah, I feel like my movement is a melding pot of African diasporic forms, contemporary forms, contemporary movement, flow, in and out of the floor, um, contact improvisation, and and guttural vocalization. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, and, you know, you it sounds like you're definitely doing something right, because as we said, you've seen, getting some acknowledgments. Um, I would imagine, you know, for anyone who is trying to navigate a creative career, they're like, how do we do this? And and I often will remind our, you know, arts administrative students and colleagues, like it is a choose your own adventure, how mm -hmm. we get through this. Yeah. Um, but I wonder as a one last question for our initial meetup here, um, what advice would you offer for anyone trying to navigate a creative career? 
One thing I would say is just really find what you have special. That mm-hmm. is, I mean, and it, sound, it, might, it might sound a little cliche, but it really has helped me even when taking class or, I mean, literally using an audition as a class, even though that sounds cliche, it really has impacted my movement. Um, and don't be afraid to step out into something that may feel uncomfortable. I was blessed to be able to throw myself into some experimental theater spaces that I wouldn't have normally put myself in, but it really opened up my eyes to how I see movement, how I see art and creation. And there's no one one way, you know, you mm. just have to kind of trust your path. And the only way that you can find that is to trust your body and find the strength in your body, find the growth in your body so that when you step into those spaces, which is really the thing of like, you may not know when the call's going to come, but mm. it's really about when the call comes, how when you step in that room, you're really rooted in knowing all of the history that you're individually bringing into that space and how you can highlight that amongst everyone else so that you're clear that even if you get the part or you don't get the part, you're clear and you're true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when you have spaces like this to be able to explore and create and choreograph, um, there's so many pots that you can pull from because of these experiences. So then it feels earned and the freedom feels liberating. Love that. Thank you for that reminder too. Tendai, we're going to bring you back later on to talk all together with Donna and with Annie B. Um, But thank you for joining us for right now. Thank you. I am excited to welcome our next guest here. We have Annie B. Parson, a co-founded Obie and Bessie Award winning Big Dance Theater in 1991. Her work with Big Dance has been commissioned by the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Sadler's Wells London, the Old Vic in London, the National Theater of Paris, the Kitchen, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Walker Art Museum, and many others. Annie B. has created choreography for opera, pop stars, television, movies, theater, ballet, symphonies, advertising, objects, museums, augmented reality, and 1,000 amateur singers. I love that that was counted, 1,000 of them. Um, Her work for theater, opera, and film includes plays by Sarah Rule, Suzanne Laurie Parks, Nico Muley, Spike Lee, and Jonathan Demme, among others. She received the Cheetah Rivera Critics' Choice Award in 2022, the Doris Duke Performing Artist Award in 2014, an Olivier Award nomination in choreography in 2015, the Foundation for Contemporary Arts in 2014, USA Artists Award, Guggenheim Fellowship in Choreography, two Bessie Awards, a Frankie Award, and three Lucille Lortel nominations. She was honored by PS122 and Dance Space in May of 2021 and has published two books on choreography. Uh, both Drawing the Surface of Dance is published by Wesleyan Press and recently The Choreography of Everyday Life. Please join me in welcoming Annie B. Parson. Hey, Annie B. Hi, Christy. I'm so glad that we get to do this. Thank you so much for bringing a giant cast. And I'm so glad that you finally got to come to Akron as well. Well, we are having a great time getting tons done and very grateful for your staff and your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was at your uh, book launch for the everyday, you know, the choreography of everyday life last fall. And so I've wanted to ask you this question for a while, like because of your illustration, your drawing practice, and also your writing practice as an author, how do those things mesh or inform your dance making practice? Is is there a sort of rhyme or reason that one comes first or is a follow to the other? Um, I want to know more. Well, I think that the drawing I started doing sort of unconsciously because when I would finish a piece, I would have this sort of strange, empty feeling. Um, you know, the the ephemerality of dance is not something that I romanticize. Um, and so I would find myself just sitting down and drawing all the objects were in the piece. Cause I tend to have a number of objects in my piece or at least a few or just the costumes, just the stuff. And I would feel like almost like I was unpacking and putting my stuff away into the drawers after a long trip. 
And it, I guess it was a kind of closure. And I got into the habit and I did that, you know, just sort of unconsciously. I really think so. And then I gathered them all one day and said, oh, wow, maybe this could be a book. So, and I continue to do that. But the drawing has expanded in that um, I've had an opportunity to draw other things too, beside my, the ends of my pieces, the aftermaths. Um, the writing is a bit different in that, um, like I was given an opportunity to write a book out of the blue during COVID. And I just was like, okay, so <laughs> I don't know how it affects my dances yet. Cause I really don't even think of myself as an author. Mm. I mean, that's, that's so real. I mean, I, I often will talk with dance makers who are like, I don't want to write grants or press releases or books. That's why I make dances. And so I think that's why I was really <laughs> curious because, because not everyone wants to put a sentence together um, using, you know, conventional words. Uh, they want to make dances instead. Yeah, it's true. But it was, it's kind of an easy um, shift for me because I had used a lot of and continue to use a lot of grammar and poetic forms in my dances. Mm. So I just sort of flipped the form and said, how can I choreograph the page? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it actually was the most enjoyable process. I mean, for someone that's worked in a room with people for, you know, decades to be alone and make something was, it was really, really interesting. Wonderful. And, um, Talk about being in a room with people. Cause that's a lot of different operating environments. If it's, advertising or more recently the hours with the Metropolitan Opera, Candide with Daniel Fish uh, over in, in France, as, as well as David Byrne's American Utopia and Here Lies Love. So between those things and then when, with your own company, um, how is choreographing the same or different across all those different working environments? Um, it's the same. It is. I think yeah. And especially I sort of had this realization when I was working in pop music that I, it's all just composition. Mm. And the, the only difference is if people trust you and they're willing to try these ideas that in our world seem sort of part of the drinking water, but in other worlds are surprising and sometimes scary mm. or, you know, formally scary, um, which I do think is a form of fear. Mm. Um, so once I sort of realized a couple jobs ago that it was all about composition, it's all about lines and space, it's, about, it's all about, you know, all the compositional elements of time, shape, space, dynamics, you know, all those things. There, it's really every job is the same if I'm not the author. Hmm. Meaning, you know, when I'm in the lead, that's a different process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that where you find that you try out new ideas or explore new territory. So there's kind of your own yeah. relationship with uncertainty. Um, Def definitely. That, that's beautifully put. I just don't know what the hell I'm doing mm -hmm. when I work by myself. Um, and when I work under a director or a musician or something, I can't afford to not to be in the, in the, in the deep, dark, you know, primeval forest. That's not where I belong. And that's where that author belongs. And I'm in service to that artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that, you know, with kind of like where you're in service to, instead of having to also lead, uh, and, and mm -hmm. explore and, and sort of say like, okay, this, I enjoy this that. way. Yeah, exactly. And I enjoy that. I like to work for, for people as well. Mm-hmm. You have Especially been, great, great artists. Yeah. Yeah. And you've worked with many great artists too. So that, what a gift to be able to continue to have that sort of dynamic and go back and forth between worlds um, as True. well. For this project that, that you're working on, you have brought in people to work with uh, you and Big Dance Theater and expanded a little bit. Um I've been thinking about the choreography of everyday life because one of the um, excerpts you talk about triangulating to various reference points and, and that that triangle may change over time depending on uh, it. Well, in the book, it's about Ulysses, Odyssey, um, and whether it's relevant um, or its relevance may adjust when you read it you know, as a teenager versus as an adult. 
by bringing in Donna Uchizono and Tendai Kumba into this next project, you sort of created your own triangle. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to name that. And I'm, I'm curious <laughs> if there are any other common reference points that you are um, exploring with them. Uh, and it's so early at the outset of this process, but I, I just had to name it. Well, you know, I, of course, I love that. And I, as a choreographer, you know, shape is very essential. So I guess I have a theory that everyone has a shape um, and mine might be a triangle. <laughs> and so I like I like that idea that you're bringing up that compositionally, maybe that's like in play here <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, I brought to the table to them and they seem to open to it, the idea. And it's a very, very broad idea that we were all looking at um, ideas around dancing together. Mm. What does it mean to dance together? What happens, what doesn't happen? Um, what are the dystopian aspects of it? What are the utopian aspects of it? Um, and it just seemed like something I've been thinking about since like 2016, I had this idea and it you know, just never manifest to really look at it. And some aspect of that is unison uh, for sure. And so, when you're the opposite of unison, I guess would be in a sense could be loneliness or isolation mm. and sort of looking at not isolation and loneliness, but instead what happens when people move together in time, it doesn't have to be dancing. Mm. We do it as a culture in many, many forms all the time. Mm -hmm. Even the way we stood during COVID when we stood six feet apart or we stood on the X's in the in the grocery store. And we were very good. We were very, very good at that. Uh, we were excellent. Um, and we were dancing together in space mm -hmm. and, and time. And the, the, the society found a unison. Um, that's just a tiny example, but you know, we're looking at, in my piece, we're looking at marching, the beauty and ecstasy of army drills. Mm. Did you know that now they still train people in the American army base camps in marching, hmm. but we don't march. They don't march, obviously. It's not a ground game anymore. Yeah. It's not, and they're not going to march, <laughs> but they still train in it because it's binding, it's bonding, it brings people together and it creates apparently a form of ecstasy. Mm. Um, and I've read quite a bit about that. So I'm just mentioning one, one thing, but in the world beyond dance, the society does move in unison in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in, I'm personally interested in that, but what Donna and Tendai are doing with it, I hope is, you know, something very much their own, you yeah. know, it's well, a very open-ended. Yeah. And it, and it's such a great reminder though, because, and you said like those of us in the dance field and world, like maybe we take for granted what it is to move together, right? Even in something as simple as across the floor, um, yeah. and that people are moving and sort of navigating together, whether it's driving on a freeway or navigating the streets of New York. And, and I have to wonder if, if maybe coming out of quarantine, we've forgotten some of that sense of coming together. Um, and, and so it's really, it, I'm, I'm thinking about when I work with some community organizers, who will reflect that, yeah, you know, we, we built a new park and we offered games on one night, but the most like successful activity were hustle lessons in a dilapidated parking lot. And it's like, yeah, yeah. people also yeah. that ecstatic feeling like to move together to maybe not use the words, but to feel that they're a part of something moving. And so of course, armies and the military are still training people to march. They're, you know, in corporate America, they'd call it team building, right? The <laughs> team building. And and we're talking about, we know as dancers, that's what's actually happening when they're doing the hustle and stuff mm -hmm. is they're getting, their bodies are becoming one, you know, that there's something physically that's occurring that um, in the army or this one writer I read about it calls making, getting bigger. Mm. Um and it can be intimidating, it can be binding, but you're becoming one when you come together in time mm -hmm. with steps. 
it's super interesting stuff, but it's, I'm sure if we had like a, you know, somebody in physics or something here, they could talk more about it on a physical level, but the, you can feel it. The process is still early. So we'll, we'll put it out there in case any physicists, you know, want to surface as you continue through this process. Um, a couple shout outs just to acknowledge, I'm, I'm going to make an, uh, assumption based on the spelling that an, another NCC Akron alum has chimed in, Terry O'Connor, Annie, you are the best triangle. Just want to give you those accolades <laughs> as they come Thanks, up. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Charmaine, I, I'm also guessing based on the spelling that this might be a, a familiar face and voice. Hello, lovely. Sorry that she's just joining us now. Um, very excited that we are surrounded by our community and finding a way to be together, even digitally. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to bring you back a little bit later, but thank you very much okay. for now, Annie. Thank you. Good to talk. All right. We have one more choreographer. It's been, it's been a rich couple of weeks, y'all. I'm saying. Um, and very excited to welcome, uh, finally this evening, Donna Uchizono, a dance artist based in New York City and artistic director of Donna Uchizono Company, which has toured throughout the U.S., Europe, Asia, South America, and Australia. A United States Artist Awardee, a Guggenheim Fellow, and Bessie recipient, Uchizono has been distinguished by numerous national awards and grants. She has been commissioned to create work for notables like Mikhail Baryshnikov, Paula Vogel, David Hammonds, and Oliver Sachs. She's active in the community and committed to mentorship advocacy for young dance makers. She served as a mentor for Sugar Salon, Double Plus at Gibney Dance Center, and currently through Donna Uchizono Company's own choreographic mentorship program, Shared Choreographic Practice. She founded the Artist Advisory Board at Dance Space Project, initiated a panel series on issues in the dance field at Gibney, and has served as a grants panelist for various funding institutions. Since 2022, Uchizono has been humbled by the distinction of being the first and only American-born choreographer of Asian ancestry in the history of modern dance, who has received cumulative national award recognition and toured an eponymous dance company across the U.S. and internationally. She has been continuously grappling with issues of invisibility, visibility, and the subsequent sense of isolation from the lack of American-born of Asian descent dance mentors who share the experience of growing up with the invisibilized scars of racism. Hey, Donna. Thanks so much for being with us. So excited we could yes, work it out. Christy. I know. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. I'm so very happy to be Yay. here. Yay. And I, I was really fascinated in um, doing some, you know, research and understanding. There was a moment with all of that, those accomplishments, there was a moment way back when that you were going to go to med school and you decided yeah. to forego that when a teacher declared you an abstract choreographer. Yes. What does that mean in your own <laughs> words, <laughs> especially because you've built an entire career around it? Well, I just have to say just briefly when, first of all, when she said it, I, th I thought I'm an abstract choreographer. And I remember running home to my mom and said, mom, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go to med school she said, why? I go, because I'm an abstract choreographer. And she said, what is that? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, but I, that, I know that's what I am. So in some ways, I still don't know what it mm -hmm. is. But I think that um, it, there was a recognition that I would be able because of being the only Asian except my sister in the high mm. school, I would be able to somehow, it was like lightning struck and that I felt like I would be able to define who mm. I was rather than the perception of me. 
And there was so much freedom Mm. in that. And when I think about abstract, now especially when I think about abstract, I, I don't see it as something that is not narrative, that it doesn't have something realistic. What I see is that it offers possibilities and also can, as, as a choreographer in, in an abstract way, it can also do something that is beyond the restraint of a word. Mm where a word when you say a word it it there's a a structure and definition and i feel like in the app, in for me that there is room mm. room to interpret and listen in a different way and but in that room. And so in some ways, sometimes, so I use it and think about it in different ways. I think about like abstract as a form, as a form, Mm -hmm. as a form of structure. And that narrative and kind of floats in the narrative and the emotional, emotionalism or representation floats in and out of that in, a, in that I can also have a very formal structure that might feel abstract, which with a just a heated interior narrative. Mm. And that that those two come forth in a way that is open and I think sometimes breathtaking. Mm. Well, it, it, I mean, I'm, but it's it's yes. not limiting, right? Like out of all the categories yes. or names, it's the one with the most room. And and something else that that we had talked about is it's almost like working and pushing beyond words. Like what's on the other side of that? Um, you describe something that I, I want to lift up that sometimes you'll talk to, to the dancers about like what, you know, sanding something down um, so that, that it's, <laughs> it's like going deeper and distilling somehow more so um, than adding the ornamentation to it maybe. Yeah. And distillation is something that I feel I like to discover, and sometimes it, when something is very distilled, it it doesn't re, doesn't I don't always remain there, but it it feels like ah I know something because it's at its essence. Mm. And just to say about words, I am not a wordsmith. I like Annie B writes. I'm I am in complete awe of anyone who can mm. write and who has the ability to express with words. I cannot. And so words have always been limiting. And for me, yes, it's it's not only distillation, but it's also an opening mm. of what that distillation. It's like sometimes you I can find the distillation and then it opens back up where I'm like, oh, I have to even find it more and that let that grow into something that is beyond, yeah, distillation, you know, something distilling something. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, with the idea, like this could be endless. It could be towards infinity. Um, When you are working, how do you know when a piece is quote unquote done? Mm. There are, are very few pieces for me that I felt were done. Awesome. I mean, obviously, once the performance is over and you don't have repeat performances, you have to accept that it's mm. done. Um, yeah, I I would say there are very few pieces that I felt like were done. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, uh, because I'm always thinking, oh, that, that little thing and stuff. But yeah, so I don't know when a piece is mm. done. 
and and pieces change when the audience changes and piece pieces change when it's a different time pieces change when it you know and so it's like that the the beauty of dance is it is life in that it's so ephemeral but it what what is happening in the moment is mm. it and then you have the next moment and the next moment so when is that done? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's ever done. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know when a piece is done. I think that, uh, the, yeah, the one piece that I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, I don't have anything else to add or say mm. or edit out. So it, it, Maybe <laughs> it's not done, but it, at least it feels full or complete. It feels, yeah. There, there's been, yeah, one, yeah, I would say one piece that felt complete. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I appreciate a, um, Janice Garrett, a choreographer uh, in San Francisco Bay Area that, that said once, like, performances are just interruptions of the creative process. <laughs> and I yeah. really... I, I completely agree. You just completely... You keep thinking, yeah, you keep thinking and thinking and oh and oh and and how as you change, the piece changes, how you change the pe- the way you perceive that piece changes. Like, mm. oh, that was what was going on and I didn't see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it it's fine. something else even indirectly that you bring up to uh, the triangulating conversation I was having with Annie B that – you you can read something in high school, you can read it again as adult, and you totally relate to it differently. It is, I think, next level artist fabulousness that you can also relate to your own work differently over time, right? That if you make something once and then now through the course of your you know, several decades in your career to revisit something and relate to it in a wholly different way is pretty amazing completely different way yes you you know mm, it's like you grow up and sometimes the pieces grow as well Mm. even though they're they're stayed in one place um and then there's some pieces that you go wow okay it stayed in one place (laughs) (laughs) it depending on the piece um yeah depending on the piece that for sure for me. How, if at all, has your sort of approach to dance making changed over time? What's that evolution been like? Or and or what has stayed the same? I think what has definitely stayed the same anyway is that I do feel like when I have the time, mm-hmm. it normally um I try to f- have a dialogue with the dance itself. And I'm coming to a place as a choreographer right now where I don't feel like I'm I'm a choreographer or I don't feel like I'm making I don't make dance. Mm. I I into it. I I like I hear I hear the the kind of quiet undercurrents that want to be heard or need to be heard and some of it is loud but are not being Mm. heard and so and so it's always it feels like i'm listening to something and and in in a dialogue and i'm like are you sure you want to go there okay well we'll we'll try Mm. and then we go and i go okay i'm not sure uh well let's see so it it's it seems like it's a constant dialogue with with the with the process and the dance itself mm. and you're you're making what what comes out then determines the structure and the architecture the larger archi- architecture of the piece comes from the dance it's like say, saying i want to be this mm. and and i'm just help being to facilitate what that is it's like okay mm. I, I, okay I, i'm with you yeah let, let's let's try that i'm not sure it's gonna work <laughs> but let's try it you know kind of thing and um 
Yeah. I love this wow, idea dance. of listening instead of making. Um, and it also reminds me of, of some of what Tendai was talking to us about um, what she looks for in dancers as nuanced listeners um, mm -hmm. to be able to relate to all the different things. And, and so mm -hmm. I'm thinking, let's bring Tendai and Annie B back into the conversation. So I, I have just a couple questions and then I would love to open it up to, for y'all to talk to each other too, because you've been working here on the ground. Um, sometimes the ships passing uh, through the day because we've been able to, you know, give you additional studio spaces. Um, so we are working in lots of different ways. Um, but I'm really curious and would love to hear for, from each of you with this idea of coming together and a larger cast, this affords different opportunities than say choreographing a solo or even working with, you know, maybe a smaller group, like four or five people. So how would each of you describe your approach to scaling up to the task at hand? Um, where, how did that say, oh, this is a scary, exciting new place. I'm going to try something. <laughs> um, or was this maybe familiar ground that you're like, oh, I haven't done it in a while, but let's go ahead. All I can say is that um, it seemed like we needed a lot of bodies in order to express this idea of dancing mm. together. And um, when I think about it personally, I, I sort of feel like I'm hallucinating a little bit. Like I close my eyes and I imagine so many things with groups, a large group of people dancing as one, so many different shapes, almost like something between you know, like if you ever see pigs in a field and there's like one running away and then the other ones kind of go and join them and then two run and then the other ones, that kind of thing. Or today I saw a bird and a bird just was, looked very random flying around and he landed. And as he landed, all these other birds landed in the exact same moment, facing the same direction in perfect unison. It's just everywhere. Mm. So it's sort of, I have, I don't have the whole group yet, so I haven't even faced mm -hmm. the multiple bodies or the exponential cells, you know, but um, that's, it's sort of a trip for my mind right yeah. now is where I'm at. I'll pass the ball to 10 guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll echo that. Definitely uh, inspiration with nature. I had a moment also watching ducks in a pond and how they flock, um, which I feel like with thinking of unison and so many bodies in one space. And we're going to have so many amazing different bodies <laughs> in one space with so much information. Um, I do. I just see like waves, waves of body, like when trees all blow at the same time <laughs> and all the leaves start to flicker. Um, yeah. But like our palms, the palms of the hand, like just that alone, a group of sea of people flipping their palms back and forth all at the same time. From far away, it's like an ant pile, like in the most amazing mm. way. <laughs> so um, that's kind of how I've been envisioning. And similar of the isolation moments of solo, individual, and how to how we la layer up on each other, mm -hmm. you know, how we come scaffold up and how we trickle back down. Mm. Well, and you went out to the Brandywine Falls today in nature yes. as well. The movement of water. We did. There was a lot of Yeah, we had a, a nice site, a site visit, a little inspiration, nature hike, and just being in the water and feeling that and having that just naturally inform the body is something that is important to me. So I was like, I can't be one with everybody else if I got to be one with mm, nature. I, <laughs> and then I can, you know, call a response from that to give to the dancers. I love that. Donna, you, you've worked with at least a, a large chunk of the dance captains. How are you scaling up to this thinking? Oh, gosh, the dance captains are, they are wickedly great. Yeah. Um the dance captains have so much information and are so intuitive, too, and nuanced. And the way they respond on just a small flicker is, it, it makes you cry. Mm. And um, so working with the, 
I had the opportunity to work with the dance captains and wow, it was such a joy and it's humbling how, how remarkable they are as artists in their own right. Mm. And, um, yeah. And also when I saw the dance, my, my, not my, but the dance captains that, uh, I am working with, uh, in 10 days, I was like, I felt like I couldn't be the mom, but I felt like the, like, the aunt or the something that I was like, oh my gosh, they just look so good with everyone. Just everyone looks so good. And anyway, it was, it's been, it's been thrilling. And, and they, we were talking earlier, Annie B and I, uh, uh, Annie B was talking about what is choreography and what is, what is, you know, how it's like, not the dancers are choreographers, but they are definitely co-collaborators. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they do, they contribute so mm-hmm. much. So, yes, um, yes. And also just about in terms of the, for me, this is the largest group that I will have worked with. Um, and I, at first I was like, wow. But, you know, I, I'm thinking, Donna, you've lived in New York City for so long. And when when you see the kinds of things that happen just spontaneously, it's it's remarkable. We see it, choreography is just happening all the mm-hmm. time, all the time. Not not only nature, but just the way people move, mm. like in unison and not. Oh, I re- remember in Fourth of July, and just hearing the hearing the uh, like the fireworks, like you hear the f- fireworks, and then hearing the awes. It's like like that. Mm-hmm. That sound, just even that, oh, mm-hmm. oh, and the the delay of sound, and 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 when you just hear that without seeing the visual, you can, it's like all of these hearts in unison or something, mm. the, a sense of awe in unison, that is so That's beautiful. I, so, oh, yeah. I, I well, I love that hearts in unison, and <laughs> and also is a reminder. Um, I mean, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but like dancers are brilliant. They're so smart. They're how can you be like an empathetic as a mover, and and how we know how to be in proximity to each other and and take care of each other. Um, and so to be able to have the space to sort of witness that, what you saw when when seeing people who you thought you knew trying on someone else's movement and how they manifest that, it is it is magic. Um, and to sort of relish in it, I I'm really excited um, uh, about that. That's coming together. My other question for for all three of you, because. Um, Getting big, uh, as as Annie B was was talking about in in uh, military thinking, um, often can be driven by music or a sound score or or something you know drumming, and and that's something else that is not predictable. Um, not every choreographer relates to music in the same way. So, um, Tendai, we talked a little bit about vocalizing, but I, I am curious, how would you? describe your relationship to sound as a part of your choreographic process. And then we'll, we'll go to Annie B and Donna again. Uh, I mean, it goes hand in hand for me. Um, I use the analogy of like the Harlem Renaissance all in one body mm. because I feel it's all with, especially from my specific approach, it's just essential. Um, if I realize even with choreographing, Sometimes the movement comes first, but sometimes more than often the sound comes first. Mm. And then how my body responds to that is where the choreography comes from. Um, And it's really important because in the last, I would say maybe since 2017, specifically starting to really understand what it is to build my own music from working with myself and my partner, Greg, and understanding a new respect for that craft, like the layering that goes into that beyond just being a vocalist, mm. but the actual composing and engineering of it has is just like translated over into the movement naturally. Um, so I feel like for me, it just goes hand in hand. It's that natural call and response, like the fireworks and ah mm. sound mm. that Donna was talking about. It feels like that's what it feels like 
for me, um, where it's like I can really pinpoint a pocket of sound or capture a sound, like even in the work that we've been building on, there are sounds of people talking like on the train. Mm. Um, and I feel that that's important of like how to keep on bringing in the sounds that I'm naturally getting every day mm. rather than having to force a sound, mm. you mm. know, um, is something that I play, I play between of like honoring what sounds are naturally happening and how I respond or how we can build around that. Um, and then when it's time to push and use sound to drive or to create emotion or to create shift um, through the space or energy shift through the space. So mm. yeah, it's hand in hand. Sound and movement for me are, they're, they're a married nice. bunch. But I also really appreciate silence. Mm. And the the sound, how sound lingers in your mind once the sound is gone and there's just silence and how it's still, you know, you, you may go to a concert and you leave, your ears are still ringing, something's still buzzing. And whatever that is, I'm also really interested in investigating through movement because of how the, it resonates and how sound resonates in the body, how it resonates in the water of our body, um, I think is really important. And I... I yeah, I. It's always just hand in hand for me. I'm like, I can't, I can't sing without dancing. I can't dance without singing. Mm. And so, as a choreographer, I feel that it's something that I'm just continuing to massage out and show that it doesn't exist just in one space. It's not just on Broadway yeah. or not just in musical theater. You know, it's it's embedded in us naturally. We're rocking our babies to sleep mm. and singing lullabies. That's like the first sound and movement, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that we get. So, you know, we have to keep honoring yeah. that. So. Excellent. Donna, I mean, uh, we were talking about moving beyond words and, and sort of distillation. How, how do you relate to music or sound in your choreographic process? I, I feel like I'm a very musical choreographer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have been very lucky because I'm not a composer to, I've been working, I've been able, oh, thank you, thank you, to work with great, great music makers mm. and composers. And so um, I usually have uh, music made to what the piece mm. is. Um, and sometimes, like with like, I found a piece of music that Oak Young Lee, who's going to be the composer, she made a while ago, and I go, oh, you know what? This might fit in in this. I'm going to let her know that actually, this older piece she made that I found on old kind of record of hers, mm. and she'll be really. I, I haven't told her yet. She's going to be. Surprise! She's going to be. Oh, yay! Okay, <laughs> like you know, and and I yeah I it's. I used to think that uh that that they they choreographed to me but it's not that it's a co-choreographing composing mm. and and the composers that I've worked with have really allowed me to also be part of the compositional part where I go oh maybe that needs to go over here and so it's been it's been a great it's a rich rich life. Inside the Dancer's Studio live series is supported by NCC Akron, the University of Akron, the University of Akron Foundation, and the Mary Schiller Myers Lecture Series in the Arts. Our podcast program is produced by Jennifer Edwards. James Sleeman is our editor. Theme music by Flaco Torres. Cover art by Micah Kraus. Transcription by Arushi Singh. Special thanks to the team on the ground in Akron, Ohio. To learn more about NCC Akron, please visit us online at nccakron.org and follow us on Instagram or Facebook at NCC Akron. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we encourage you to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform by searching for Inside the Dancer's Studio. Thanks so much for listening and stay curious.